All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another broadcast. You're listening to Hardcore Harry, and I am Death to the New World Order, coming to you live on truthbroadcastnetwork.com. And tonight we're going to be talking about financial servitude, financial slavery. And, you know, every time I really think about the New World Order, and you can think about any aspect of it, it's really about control. That's really the one – if you could describe it with one word, it's control. They want to control everything, every aspect of your life, and the number one control system is the money itself. Even in the Bible, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. How many people do things they would not normally do because they need the money? And it is the financial system set up by the central banks – that pull strings, even on good people, pull their strings and make them do things that they would find reprehensible, but they got to put food on the table. They got kids to feed. How many cops tase people that don't need tased or beat or even shoot people because they got to put food on the table for their children? We're going to focus primarily on how people are put into a position where they become debt slaves. They're deceived, especially at a young age, into going so far into debt that they cannot repay it. And then they have to spend the rest of their life working, slaving, and toiling, trying to pay back a debt they never should have took on to begin with. And it really brings up several aspects of what we deal with, and one of them being contracts. You know, if you look at the Disney movie Aladdin, it shows the genie. Now, how many of you know the, the genie is actually called jinn? And the word jinn, the Arabic word jinn, actually means demon. Demon. So when you see the Disney movie Aladdin and you see the genie dancing around and saying, you never had a friend like me, I can make you rich, I can make you powerful, and unrolls this contract and said, just sign your name here. That's how evil works, folks. The contract. And it's depicted in that cartoon just perfectly. And if you don't have an idea of what evil truly is or how it works, you think, oh, well, this is just a children's cartoon. I went through this with my sister. She used to always sit the children in front of the Disney Channel. And so they absorbed all that. And I would tell her for years and years and years. You're hurting them. You need, to, you need to shut Disney off. You need to shut the cable off. And finally she did. Thank God, finally she did. And I'll tell you what. After my sister's family finally shut the cable off, it was like they blossomed. They didn't wake up to the whole of the New World Order overnight, obviously. But when we used to go over there, they were zombies, You couldn't have a conversation. In fact, I was lucky if I could get one sentence out of my mouth before I was interrupted, cut off, ignored, or they were staring back at the TV like zombies. That all changed once the the cable was shut off. They had an attention span that they didn't have before. They cared about things they didn't care about before. It was – it's really something to see and they're still – they're still moving forward with all that, so I'm, I'm happy about that. But, but these things are normalized through the television, through the Hollywood movies. People are conditioned to think that these things are not only normal, they're okay. I mentioned the other day while I was on air the Monopoly game that I used to love and play when I was a child. And what's it teach you? You got to have money. The game of life. So many board games, money. You got to have money. When I was a kid, I had a little cash register. I was indoctrinated. Money, the little golden coins that are actually chocolate wrapped up in gold tin foil or whatever. Money. People are indoctrinated. You you got to have money. And I'm not saying money in and of itself is evil. And there's so many people who misquote the Bible and say money is the root of all evil. It's not. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Now, you could also say the love of a car that you don't need. That you go so far in debt to buy that you owe so much money, you become a slave to the system working to pay it all back. So we're going to start the broadcast by actually looking at this video again, the story of your enslavement. And when you're watching this video, 
What you need to understand is that, as it says, there have been several phases of slavery, and it is all climaxed during our day and age with financial servitude, financial slavery. You're a debt slave. You know, it is said that gold is the currency of kings. Silver is the currency of gentlemen. Money is the currency of peasants. And debt, debt is the servitude of slaves. This is the story of your enslavement. How it came to be and how you can finally be free. Like all animals, human beings want to dominate and exploit the resources around them. At first we mostly hunted and fished and ate off the land, but then something magical and terrible happened to our minds. We became, alone among the animals, afraid of death and of future loss. And this was the start of a great tragedy and an even greater possibility. You see, when we become afraid of death, of injury and imprisonment, we become controllable and so valuable in a way that no other resource could ever be. The greatest resource for any human being to control is not natural resources or tools or animals or land, but other human beings. You can frighten an animal because animals are afraid of pain in the moment, but you cannot frighten an animal with a loss of liberty, with torture or imprisonment in the future, because animals have very little sense of tomorrow. You cannot threaten a cow with torture or a sheep with death. You cannot swing a sword at a tree and scream at it to produce more fruit or hold a burning torch to a field and demand more wheat. You cannot get more eggs by threatening a hen, but you can get a man to give you his eggs by threatening him. This human farming has been the most profitable and destructive occupation throughout history, and it is now reaching its destructive climax. Human society cannot be rationally understood until it is seen for what it is. A series of farms where human farmers own human livestock. Some people get confused because governments provide health care and water and education and roads and thus imagine that there is some benevolence at work. Nothing could be further from the reality. Farmers provide health care and irrigation and training to their livestock. Some people get confused because we are allowed certain liberties and thus imagine that our governments protect our freedoms. But farmers plant their crops a certain distance apart to increase their yields and will allow certain animals larger stalls or fields if it means they will produce more meat and milk. In your country, your tax farm, your farmer grants you certain freedoms, not because he cares about your liberties, but because he wants to increase his profits. Are you beginning to see the nature of the cage you were born into? There have been four major phases of human farming. The first phase in ancient Egypt was direct and brutal human compulsion. Human bodies were controlled, but the creative productivity of the human mind remained beyond the reach of the whip and the brand and the shackles. Slaves remained woefully underproductive and required enormous resources to control. The second phase was the Roman model 
wherein slaves were granted some capacity for freedom, ingenuity, and creativity, which raised their productivity. This increased the wealth of Rome, and thus the tax income of the Roman government, and with this additional wealth Rome became an empire, destroying the economic freedoms that fed its power and collapsed. I'm sure that this does not seem entirely unfamiliar. After the collapse of Rome, the feudal model introduced the concept of livestock ownership and taxation. Instead of being directly owned, peasants farmed land that they could retain as long as they paid off the local warlords. This model eventually broke down due to the continual subdivision of productive land and was destroyed during the enclosure movement when land was consolidated and hundreds of thousands of peasants were kicked off their ancestral lands because new farming techniques made larger farms more productive with fewer people. The increased productivity of the later Middle Ages created the excess food required for the expansion of towns and cities, which in turn gave rise to the modern democratic model of human ownership. As displaced peasants flooded into the cities, a huge stock of cheap human capital became available to the rising industrialists, and the ruling class of human farmers quickly realized that they could make more money by letting their livestock choose their own occupations. Under the democratic model, direct slave ownership has been replaced by the mafia model. The mafia rarely owns businesses directly, but rather sends thugs around once a month to steal from the business owners. You are now allowed to choose your own occupation, which raises your productivity and thus the taxes you can pay to your masters. Value this time in your life, kids, because this is the time in your life when you still have your choices. And it goes by so around much of the democratic model is that increases in wealth and freedom threaten the farmers. The ruling classes initially profit from a relatively free market in capital and labor, but as their livestock become more used to their freedoms and growing wealth, they begin to question why they need rulers at all. Ah, well, nobody ever said that human farming was easy. Keeping the tax livestock securely in the compounds of the ruling classes is a three-phase process. The first is to indoctrinate the young through government, quote, education. As the wealth of democratic countries grew, government schools were universally inflicted in order to control the thoughts and souls of the livestock. The second phase is to turn citizens against each other through the creation of dependent livestock. It is very difficult to rule human beings directly through force, and where it can be achieved, it remains cripplingly underproductive, as can be seen in North Korea. Human beings do not breed well or produce efficiently in direct captivity. Ah, but if human beings believe that they are free, then they will produce much more for their farmers. The best way to maintain this illusion of freedom is to put some of the livestock on the payroll of the farmer. Those cows that become dependent on the existing hierarchy will then attack any other cows who point out the violence, hypocrisy, and immorality of human ownership. Officers positioned Grant face first on the floor with one officer near his head, a second near his back, and a third officer standing nearby. There appeared to be a brief struggle. Then, a two-year veteran Bart officer stands, draws his weapon, and fires. Freedom is slavery, and slavery is freedom. If you can get the cows to attack each other, whenever anybody brings up the reality of their situation, then you don't have to spend nearly as much controlling them directly. 
those cows who become dependent upon the stolen largesse of the farmer, will violently oppose any questioning of the virtue of human ownership. And the intellectual and artistic classes, always and forever dependent upon the farmers, will say to anyone who demands freedom from ownership, you will harm your fellow cows. The livestock are thus kept enclosed by shifting the moral responsibility for the destructiveness of the violent system to those who demand real freedom. The third phase is to invent continual external threats so that the frightened livestock cling to the protection of the farmers. This system of human farming is now nearing its end. The terrible tragedies of modern Western economic systems has occurred not in spite of, but because of, past economic freedoms. The massive increases in Western wealth throughout the 19th century resulted from economic freedoms. And it was this very increase in wealth that fed the size and power of the state. Whenever the livestock become exponentially more productive, you get a corresponding increase in the number of farmers and their dependents. The growth of the state is always proportional to the preceding economic freedoms. Economic freedoms create wealth, and the wealth attracts more thieves and political parasites, whose greed then destroys the economic freedoms. In other words, freedom metastasizes the cancer of the state. The government that starts off the smallest will always end up the largest. This is why there can be no viable and sustainable alternative to a truly free and peaceful society. A society without political rulers, without human ownership, without the violence of taxation and statism. To be truly free is both very easy and very hard. We avoid the horror of our enslavement because it is so painful to see it directly. We dance around the endless violence of our dying system because we fear the attacks of our fellow livestock. But we can only be kept in the cages we refuse to see. Wake up. To see the farm is to leave it. Truth Broadcast Network is not responsible for the content of independent broadcasters. We are a loose affiliation of activists bonded together by our common struggle. As such, the network is here to act as a central hub for truth activism. The network is here to aid both those creating content and those searching for it. All broadcasters act independently and they connect through the network. Broadcasters have no control over the network and the network has no control over them. There is no liability on the part of any broadcaster for any action or statement that is not their own. Good. Uh, no, I'm, I'm uh, pretty good tonight. I just had surgery earlier today, so my voice is a little bit messed up. Um, oh yeah, like uh, uh, years ago I uh, had to declare bankruptcy because we ran our credit cards up and we were all in that par paradigm. Right. Now, how did that go when, when you went through bankruptcy? Was it brutal? Was it, you know, a little easier than you thought it should have been? What, what are your thoughts on that? Can you hear me, Sean? Yeah, yeah, 
I don't. I'm, I got a lot of delay here. I'm hearing you a couple times. Is there any way to stop that? Or um, you probably have the site, the the live stream open. So while we're talking on Skype, you'll want to pause or mute the live stream. Okay, I'll do that right now. All right. And that goes for anybody else. When you call in, you're going to want to pause or mute the live stream. Okay, so so you mentioned you went through bankruptcy, and I was wondering, you know, as you know, I have not gone through that at least yet. What did you think of that? Do you think it was fair the way it, they do it, or, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, it cost a bit of money to do it. Uh, we had to save up for it. Me and my wife had to. Um, I, she had ran up debt under her name, and I had signed a, uh, oh, oh, what was it, uh, a co-signed with a loan for her. So I had to declare bankruptcy also because when the loan, when she defaulted on her forty thousand dollar loan, I had to uh, um, make good for it, and I didn't have any money either at the time. So um, it was uh, pretty brutal. You know, we didn't own a house, which fortunately was was good, so we didn't lose our house or anything like that, and we were renting. Um, but after, the hardest thing was, was learning how to uh, save money up and buy things um, that we needed um, with the money we saved instead of buying it ahead of time and paying all the time. Um, right, so you, you had to break your, your use of credit cards and that kind of thing. Yeah, and... Uh, um, we learned to live that way, and, and I learned to live with a lot, a lot of, uh, I realized I didn't need a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, okay, well, I mean, it, would you say you're better off living that way? Yeah, no, I know. I think it's great the way we live now. I don't, I don't really want for anything. We never really needed anything to begin with other than, you know, shelter and food and entertainment. Um, it, uh, it, it's the best thing I ever did. I, I feel. Okay, now yeah. that's interesting because I've done a broadcast showing how Edward Bernays, they used psychology and psychiatry basically, psychoanalysts to engineer what they call happiness machines. You know, at some point during the industrial age, they realized people already have all of the things that they need. We need to make them buy things that they want but they don't need. And, and that's when they, they took propaganda, changed the name to public relations, went to Madison Avenue and started, started schooling them on how to trick people into buying things they didn't even need and turn people into happiness machines. So it's not about what this pickup will do for you. It's about you'll feel better if you have it. And they started playing on everyone's emotions. And by and large, the nation really fell for this. But, I mean, you've, you've come out of that stage. I've come out of it. And, you know, yes. obviously, we as a nation are so far in debt, we'd be a lot better off if, if people stopped running around buying things that they did not need. So I appreciate your, your perspective on that. Anything else on your mind tonight? Um, yeah, well, well, where you're saying that, I just I remember before being thinking I, I needed things to be happy all the time. And, and I, um, I would, you know, always dream of what the next thing I thought I needed. Um, eventually, I, I woke up after that. Uh, um, I started to work up slowly. Um, and then I decided to go through everything I owned. And I, and I thought I started to become a bit of a hoarder. So I just got everything that I collected over the years, and I, I threw out things I had for like, you know, almost 35 years. Some of this, uh, a truck, and took it to the dump. I, I it was three truckloads of stuff, that, and it was it was uh, it was like uh, I was free yeah. after I got rid of all that stuff. Right. Well, I mean, there's a saying, you know, that our possessions own us rather than we own in them. You know, once you reach a certain point. You're so busy fixing things you didn't need or buying things you don't need. You know, we end up being slaves to the things that we own. So, all right, Sean. Yeah. Well, it was it was good talking to you. Call in any time. All right. Thanks very much, Harry. You have a great day. You too. Good night. All right. So that was Sean Summers, a first time caller here on Death to the New World Order. Now I have downloaded some video clips. One of the things I want to focus in on quite specifically is the college loan bubble. That is one of the the, the next financial disaster 
is going to be the college loan thing. And I'll tell you why, because you can't write them off with the bankruptcy. You can't you can't get out of that debt, and it's absolutely inevitable that we're going to have a massive college loan bubble that's going to burst here sooner or later. So I've already downloaded plenty of video on it. I'm just going to go ahead and transfer, and I'm almost afraid to transfer them all at once. I'll put you on screen so you can watch the disaster. I'm almost afraid to transfer all this video at once into the video editing software, but we'll just see what happens here. Looks like it's going pretty smooth. Nothing crashed. So I'll drop some videos down below where they fit. And we're just going to look at different people with different perspectives about this coming disaster and whatever else they've got. And, uh, and then we'll be back. Advertising is the art of making you want something so bad you have to buy it. If you don't buy this product or service, your life is over. Modern advertising transcends mere billboard campaigns. It incorporates songs on the radio, themes in TV and movies, things that you see and hear all the time but never recognize as ads. You never know you're being sold, and that's the trick. But I'm not talking about the latest car or some line of shoes. You know you're being sold on those things. I'm talking about college. No college equals no future. That's what the billboard tells us. That's what television tells us. But is that the truth? I don't think so. I've never had the disadvantage of attending a four-year university, and I couldn't be more happy or successful. I even know uneducated people like me who receive honorary degrees, so the schools can look good. I'm expecting mine any day now. For the most part, college is a giant scam, but even worse, in my opinion, is that it wastes four years of your life. I know, this is shocking. We've all been led to believe that education is somehow altruistic. It's bigger than business. But wake up, people. I don't call it college. I call it big education. Just like big oil, big tobacco, and big government. No college equals no future? Tell that to Michael Dell of Dell Computers. No college degree. The fabulous Coco Chanel, no college degree. Henry Ford, Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs, no college degrees. Richard Branson, founder of Virgin and the 360 companies it now owns. He didn't even finish high school. Neither did Walt Disney, by the way. Even better, the voice of excellence, America's anchorman, Rush Limbaugh, no college degree. Honestly, I could go on all day listing successful people who didn't need college. See, big education needs you to believe that without their degree, your life is over. On the contrary, eight out of 10 college grads don't even work in the field, but they went hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt to study. It's high time that we as Americans rethink this archaic paradigm. Long ago, I thought about attending film school, but then I realized it was better to learn for free and gain real-world experience as a film company intern than it was to go into debt as a college student. And now, as the president of an award-winning film company, I have a family, I travel the world, I meet fascinating people. It's a dream job. Remember, college is a product, just like life insurance or Coca-Cola. The difference is, life insurance is cheap, and it doesn't take four years to drink a Coke. Hi, Keith Abel here. Just wanted to shoot a short blog post. I want you to think about this for a moment. The influential people the mega global corporations of the world, they want you in debt. They want you to do as they tell you, to live based on their agenda. You get out of school, you get flooded with credit card offers. They want you to buy stuff. They want you to use credit. They want you to pay the minimum. 
They want you to basically become an ATM machine for them for the rest of your life. Then they convince you to get a higher education in an education system that is absolutely broken. The cost of that education is totally out of control. They say, no problem, we'll give you a student loan. They say, don't worry about it, we'll give you a little extra money to cover your expenses. It's taking longer than you thought to get through school? No problem, we can give you more student loans. Take an extra year, take an extra two years, no problem. That education's really valuable. But how valuable is it, really? Is it worth $100,000, $200,000 just to make thirty dollars to $40,000 per year? Is it worth paying on that student loan and the interest on them for decades? That's what they want you to do. In addition to that, the dream is to own your own home. So they want you to buy the maximum house that you can possibly buy, and they want you to pay for that over 30 years. In fact, they now have mortgages that, where you can pay for over 40 years. So go to work, work hard, because they not only want you to pay the credit cards, they not only want you to pay the student loans, they not only want you to pay that mortgage, not only that, they really think you should get a couple of cars, and not just a basic car, but the maximum car that you can possibly get. It's okay. You can work a little bit harder and pay the minimum payment on those as well. You know, you work so hard, maybe you should even get a vacation home, or a fancy boat, or take that really nice vacation to see that mouse. It's okay. You deserve it. Just put it on your credit card, or better yet, take out a second mortgage. That's okay. You can pay on them for the rest of your life, and you know what? They will give you a job making just a little bit less than what you need to get ahead. So here you are. You're in this system, allowing yourself to be bought at wholesale and sold at retail in your job because you're a slave, a slave to the interest and a slave to the credit cards, a slave to the student loans, a slave to your home, your car. You don't own your life anymore. Your life was taken away from you voluntarily, and you offered your life up for short-term pleasure, and now you get to work for the rest of your life and hopefully get back to zero. Not a good plan. Here's a suggestion for you. Network marketing, in my opinion, is the best escape plan. This is Colin O'Keefe for LXBN TV. It's gone somewhat under the radar in comparison to other issues, but the student loan crisis has reached, quote, bubble bursting levels. Joining me today to explain how bad it is and what it means for the future is Douglas Bates of Berger Singerman and their blog, The Business Reorganization Report. Doug, first off, just how bad is the state of student loans? Can you give us some figures on, on just how bad the debt is? Sure. Thank you, Colin. There are two ways to define how bad it is uh, that stand out, and we've blogged about it at The Business Re Reorganization Report. Um, the first is the number one trillion dollars, which is a number that's growing, and that's the amount of student loan debt um, that's circulating throughout the United States. And the reason we view that as a, as a bad thing um, is because it's finding its way onto the budgets of every household, but as an item that people don't know exactly how to deal with, and the number's ever increasing. Um, that puts a strain on people's monthly budgets, uh, but it also puts a strain on uh, the education system as, as a whole, because this is how people finance their college educations. It's also how colleges are able to grow and do some amazing things, the research and things that they're able to do uh, with this type of money. The fear is, is as the debt grows, uh, whether or not the next bad thing, delinquencies, continues to grow. And I'd say of the two, the delinquencies is more concerning than the amount of debt. And that's because as the delinquencies rise, you could see a curtailment in the uh, availability of student loans, or at least an increase in the interest rate. And historically, the lower levels of interest rates available for student loans is what's made them so uh, appealing, generally. Uh, and if you see that go away, um, you could have multi-level effects for higher education, uh, for the average consumer, which would be your average college student, um, and across the board. So those are the, those are the big bad figures in the room that we see uh, standing out as, as, a, as a problem. Interesting. So, so second, as we look at the multiple things that come up, you know, what does this mean and what could happen in the future? Who will be hit the hardest if, you know, things really do off, go off the rails? Well, you have two, 
two people, two individual groups that would be hit the hardest. I, I think your average consumer is, is the person of student loans who see you have to look out for, and, and that's what's driving this big number, is you have folks that have student loan debt in, in the multi-thousand dollars uh, across the spectrum, and, and that debt is very important because it finances college education. If that debt is not available, just as a, strictly as a consumer of debt, not available, then you have the spillover into college education. And that is, is the college education that you're able to afford now because of student loan debt uh, going to still be there? Because eventually private lenders, when a delinquency level reaches a certain amount, you're going to see what we saw in the credit crisis and what we're still seeing, which is uh, people not lending. And when people don't lend, whether it's as a reaction to the subprime lending crisis in, in mortgages that we've seen over the past five years, uh, what happens? Well, that means that someone can't finance a higher education, and, and we all lose. So that's the number one thing, is the consumer of student loans, your average students. Uh, the second thing is, is on the other side, of going to colleges themselves and universities, uh, because they rely on the availability of this money to support their programs. Um, we have seen rises in tuition, and, and there's a lot of data out there that says tuition has been rising because of the availability of money at the student loan level. So you have those issues. And lastly, you have private lenders. And there is a bill uh, being introduced into the Congress in the United States to uh, allow for the dischargeability, which is a big word, uh, in bankruptcy uh, of private student loans. And if that happens, you might see some initial losses for uh, the private lending industry, but the biggest problem will be, most likely, an increase in the interest rates uh, that private lenders charge. So while they may lose in the short term by having their debts discharged in bankruptcy, consumers may lose on the, the, the end of the day, so to speak, because of an increase in interest rates. So that's, those are a couple of the, of the what we would call the losers of a bubble burst, but the, the effects are far reaching and then we haven't begun to scratch the surface of what it's looking like, but I think people are starting to realize there's a problem um, and it's a question of whether or not we're gonna deal with it before it bursts. Definitely. And when you describe some of the symptoms with students not being able to pay back loans and then tuition going up because they're not paying back loans and then more loans for the tuition's higher, it, the symptoms make it sound a lot like a bubble. So it is going to be interesting to watch to see how we address this issue. Uh, again, that was Douglas Bates of Berger Singerman and the Business Reorganization Report. For more of his commentary, visit Business Reorganization. We would like to thank all who tune in, and especially all who bring others to the network so that we can unplug them from the false reality. Remember you can show people how to tune in on their cell phones by searching their internet radio application for TBN. Truth Broadcast Network would especially like to thank its tireless broadcasters who sacrifice their time, energy and resources working against the enemy. There is a price to pay for their selfless effort enlightening the world. Thus we thank broadcasters and ask the audience to be supported by spreading the word about the live broadcasts and spreading the archives as much as possible. Every year, millions of Americans enroll in college. Back in 1952, a year's tuition at Harvard cost $600. Today, that would equal almost $5,000, but in 2012, the actual cost is more than $36,000. That's a huge increase, and it's getting out of control. Over the past 25 years, tuition has increased yearly at a rate six percentage points higher than inflation. To keep up, students are borrowing more money. Two-thirds of all students are now in debt, and the average graduate owes over $25,000 on student loans alone. Total national student debt is almost $1 trillion, more than our total national credit card debt. So what's causing all this? Credential inflation, easy access to loans, and the decreasing value of the American dollar. As more students attend college, their degrees, or credentials, become less valuable. So many go back for more degrees and take on more debt. And the government backs this with taxpayer dollars. Last year, at one private university, over 88% of its revenue came from federal programs. Student loans are easy to get, but nearly impossible to get out from under. 
Just like with the real estate bubble, little or no research is done to see if borrowers qualify. Since 2005, the student loan default rate has nearly doubled. What does all this mean? It means that student debt is crippling the future of America's youth. The average graduate has to postpone major life events, like buying a house and starting a family, while he or she struggles to find a job and pay off the loans. Is this the best way to create a more educated, competitive and entrepreneurial society? Joining me now to talk more about the emotional and financial toll student debt takes on Americans is Kyle McCarthy, director of community outreach for Default, the student loan documentary. Welcome, Kyle. So tell us about your findings in making your documentary, just how serious the student debt problem has become in the U.S. Well, well first of all, thank you for having me on today. And, uh, you know, we're constantly seeing so many crazy stories and it never ceases to amaze me uh what we'll see and uh, well default really uh it really looks at the stories of uh people that have taken out private student loans and those are the stories or those are the student loans that really have less consumer protections than the federal student loans so those are what we're really seeing even more today than we were uh several years ago so you know, Sally May, they're really investing in these private student loans today. And that's what they've been dumping millions and millions of dollars of lobbying money into to really chip away and to to um, rip away the consumer rights for. So we're, we're seeing people that can't get married and that have had their credit destroyed and their lives ripped, ripped upside down um, because their credit is destroyed and they can't get jobs once their credit is destroyed because their 60% uh, of employers are now checking uh, credit reports. Uh, that's, I mean, that's an example. Um, I mean, we're seeing people that have, have to pay multiple times what they took out. So, I mean, it's just, it just, it's just endless what we're, we're seeing today. And it's just unfair and something has to be done about it. And, um, you know, that's one reason why I got involved with the Occupy graduation movement and, um, and that's what's really kind of spreading right now. And we're, we're setting, like what I heard earlier when you were talking about earlier is we're, we're spreading this to the, the campuses and we're, we're allowing the campuses to take the shackles, the balls and chains to the campuses and to wear their debt on their caps and gowns to show that, you know, we're drowning in this. People are drowning in this and can't get out. Now, Kyle, I do want to show uh, a clip. I believe we have a clip of your documentary. unemployed, I'm disabled, I'm moving with my mother, I have no income. If it weren't for my mother right now, Sally Mae would be calling me in a cardboard box on a street in San Francisco. And I still think if that were the case, Sally Mae would still want their money. So a very sad story there, but are many Americans, many more Americans in the same shoes as him? Yeah, I mean, and we're only going to see more of that with, uh, I mean, with this generation today that is being forced to take out so much debt and, and with the inflated college price. And uh, Kyle, how do we get to this point? Uh, the, the magnitude of the problem, the student debt problem is unprecedented. You, you know, I, I think one, one major reason is the removal of bankruptcy protection so there's really whether or not someone wants to file for bankruptcy or not that's one key defense mechanism that a consumer has because once that's removed there that's really not capitalism anymore so that that's something that no one can really fall back on so that i mean that allows prices to just explode and so when not only that we've got a lender such as sally may which owns the collection companies as well and they're dumping millions of dollars into lobbying and they're buying our legislators. So, and they also own the collection companies and can tack on an extra 25% on top of your loan and collect on the back end as well. So people are having their lives destroyed because they wanted to better their lives and it is just not fair. 
And that is one reason why we're seeing such an uproar over the last few years. And now we have this Occupy, as you mentioned before, Occupy student debt in the works. Uh, what effect do you hope this will have? Well, well I mean, we're already seeing the effect. We're seeing, we're, we're seeing uh, legislators actually pay attention and saying, like, oh, my goodness, like, you know, we have to, we have to at least acknowledge that Generation Y, the millennials, are, are in serious trouble. You know, we're seeing um, Representative Hanson Clark has really come out and said, you know, uh, here's a bill, the uh, forget, uh, HR 4170. Here's something we have to at least like uh, put forth and you know raise. And people have to come together and uh, at least raise the issue of student debt forgiveness. Um, you know, unfortunately, we haven't really seen uh, the Republicans do much about this except tell uh, our generation to pull yourselves up from your bootstraps when, you know, there are no bootstraps left. And, you know, that's really unfortunate because, you know, when our parents were our age, school was so cheap and so much cheaper if not, if they paid anything at all. And now it has, you cannot work up a, a part-time job or a full-time job and pay for school. You have to pay for it over your entire lifetime. And that is so sad and if you do are able to pay for it it's a um, good luck getting a really good job and like you said earlier 50 percent of people coming out of school have a job if they have one at all all right kyle um thank you very much for coming on the show that was kyle mccarthy director of community outreach for the documentary default the student loan documentary if all you do is post on Facebook, you are hiding your information from the real world and the real internet. Nothing will ever come up in a search engine. If you want to avoid being censored, blocked or shut down, then post on Truth Broadcast Network. You can then share the professional web pages inside the free speech zone. This way your material will come up in search engines, and it will exist inside and outside the free speech zone. Facebook is a trap. Empower yourself by empowering Truth Broadcast Network. Remember to contact us with your username so we can allow your profile privileges to post. Do you think government bailouts are over? Think again. With the feds now controlling the entire student loan market, taxpayers may soon be up on the hook for unpaid loans. Check this out. Barclays is warning that we may see a tsunami of student loan defaults through 2020, saying that the industry underestimated defaults by a whopping $225 billion. Euro-Pacific's Peter Schiff says that the government should never have gotten into this sector in the first place. Diana Carew of the Progressive Policy Institute says the government has to be involved. High school is not in enough in this day and age. Peter, good to have you on the program and thank you Diana for joining us. Why is this a bad idea, Peter? Well, you know, just like the government inflated a housing bubble, the reason that tuitions are so high is because government guarantees the loans. And now students take these guarantees and bid tuitions through the roof, take the government out of the equation, and the colleges and universities have to lower tuitions so students can afford to go. But the beneficiaries of these high tuitions are not the students. They get stuck with the debt. It's the colleges and the universities that can sell overpriced degrees. And unfortunately, right now, We've got a lot of people with college degrees, waiting tables, cleaning toilets, you know, driving taxis, and they have enormous government debt to pay back out of these small salaries that they earn. Yeah, yeah well, that's a good point. Diana, you're saying that the government has to be involved. Why? Because investment in human capital is never a waste of money. Of all the things that the government can spend their money on, entitlement programs, subsidizing the housing sector, human capital should never be sacrificed. And I completely agree that the college graduates today, especially young college graduates, have been hard hit by the recession, a recession they never predicted. And it's not fair to ask them to shoulder the burden alone. They have seen their wages fall by 15 percent in real terms over the last decade. Meanwhile, their debt has risen 25 percent. And it's completely unacceptable to suggest that every college uh, student uh, does not have the right to go to school. They should all have the opportunity to pursue an education. But, well, I mean, you know, look at these numbers. Barclays warning that we're going to see a tsunami of student loan defaults through 2020. So how, how has the government been positive here? 
I think the government has a clear role to play here in the long term. I mean, look, we need to realize, and as soon as we all agree, that education is a social good, we'll all be better off. We need to invest in our future. We need to invest in the economy. And right now, the economy is the big problem. There aren't enough jobs being created for college grads, especially young college grads. So they are driving buses. They are hairstylists. And that's a big problem because they're taking, they're squeezing, essentially, young uh, non-college grads out of those jobs. And and then they're taking a pay cut that can't well, pay for their debt. And well, so the problem is is having a low growth economy. We need the only yeah, way out of this is to educate let, kids let, and let, get let, them into jobs that are better paid. Let me let me get a word in here because wasting money overpaying for worthless degrees is not going to help the economy. In fact, it no hurts the economy. No degree is worthless. You're oh, always oh, acquiring skills. You're no, always no. acquiring skills. It's whether no. or not the jobs are there that you no, can a utilize lot of, those a skills. Lot of, a lot of the curriculum, a lot of the courses do very little to improve human capital. Look, plenty of people went to college before the government got involved. It just didn't cost nearly as much. People didn't graduate college with a mortgage. Now they do. I don't but the think problem colleges is, are setting prices based on how much students can take out of yeah, of course. No, no. They're, they're basing their prices on the fact that students can borrow money with government guarantees. If the government got out of the market... I think there's more to it than that. No, no there isn't. That's exactly the problem. I if the government If the government got out of the market, students couldn't borrow money so cheaply. Interest rates would rise, and students wouldn't be able to bid up prices. Right, Colleges so then would, you get to decide who gets to go to college, and so only no, rich I, I students get to go to college. No, That's a very would, good message no, to send. It, it, it's, it's not up to the government to pay for everybody's college college degree and you don't have a right to go to college I mean people should go to college a I think if, everybody should have the opportunity to go to college and I don't think you should decide who gets to go to no, college I'm not and who deciding gets to have it but, the government, but, by, but by subsidizing it they create this huge bubble do you think students are really better off I've had plenty of students on my radio show the biggest regret in their life is that they went to college because now they're stuck with an enormous debt I had one they're young stuck woman with a low innovation show. economy that's not creating no, no. the right type of job well, one and of the reason the, the reason they're not creating the jobs is the government is diverting all the capital to education of and it's not going to businesses. Of all things the government is spending money on, I hardly would suggest that no. human capital, I would be hard pressed it, no. to find somebody that would suggest that investing well, you, in college you, education is a bad investment. Yeah, you but found me. It's a lousy investment. We, we, we are squandering It's never a lousy investment and when that's the yes, case, then we've got a real problem on no, our no, hands no. because the only not way everybody. forward, the only way to invest in our future is through education. No, not that everybody is the way needs, to growth. Not everybody needs a college degree. This is, what you're doing is Playing into the universities I'm not and colleges, everybody needs a they want to they want to exploit our kids. Should get to go to college. They should have no. that opportunity. But they but have no, the opportunity the without is, who's the government. For it? I mean, who's paying for it? I mean, our taxpayers Ultimately, once again on the on the hook here. Like well, with other things, like with entitlement programs, like with the housing sector, of all of the things that taxpayers would be on the hook for, I would argue that education is probably no, one uh, of the least uh, controversial. Oh, it is very controversial. And, you know, the, because of the government, today, a college degree is not worth the price that you pay for it. Not only in the cost, but the, that, the five or six years that, you, that, you, that, you, that you're not in a labor force. But if we simply got the government out of education, I, college tuitions would plunge. College I, would be I do to not compete. agree with that. Oh, well, I do let, not let think that you don't economic. need college. I think well, there's. The, I, I, I'm well aware of basic economics. Thank you. But I, I well, would argue you're that. Not. Yes, I am. Thank you. But I would argue that there's a lot more variables at play in a college. Well, no. College prices. It's, it's prices. As opposed prices to, are determined by supply and demand. If you take away the demand by taking away the guaranteed loans, colleges will have to stop building these fancy gymnasiums and and these fancy uh, you know off you know campus housings or the big restaurants, they'll have to cut prices, they'll have to cut the pay of some of their they'll administrators and bureaucrats. They'll have to cut their faculty, they'll yeah. have to cut their technology, no. they'll have to cut their investment. No, Absolutely. they won't. No, no, yes, they'll, 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 they will. The technology will probably increase. Look, in the 1950s, students got great educations in college, yeah. and it didn't cost anything. Pe kids used to work their way through college, and they graduated debt three, and free there were with jobs degrees. For them. I right, know. You know and what, we're going we're gonna to agree to disagree because are these they? are all very, very good points. Uh, thank you so much. Peter, Diana, great conversation. <laughs> thank we appreciate you very you much. Laying, laying it all out for us. Uh, <laughs> thank for you. Having... It's the ball and chain that stays with you until the day you die. It cannot be expunged or forgiven. It's the student debt bubble, and it's the looming crisis hanging over the head of every American. 
Weeks ago marked the day that student debt hit the $1 trillion mark. And for the students who are the lowest and in the lowest economic tier, things just got substantially tougher. Starting July 1st, federal Pell Grants are set to be cut for thousands of students. Here are the students that will be affected by the cuts. 65,000 new college students without diplomas or GEDs. 63,000 students who have been in school more than new maximum of six years under the Pell Grant. 300,000 students will have their grants reduced or eliminated because of more stringent income requirements. So what is going to happen when the student debt bubble bursts? Or can this crisis be averted? For more on that, I'm joined by Sarah Jaffe, Associate Editor at Alternet.org. Sarah, what do you think about the recent decision to cut these Pell Grants? Well, it's class war, Abby. I mean, how else do you phrase it? I mean, I was out at a march last night with a bunch of student activists here, and their new chant, their new favorite chant is, one, two, three, four, tuition fees are class war. Um, the Pell Grants go to the poorest students. They go to the ones who don't qualify for merit aid. Um, in this case, they're cutting them, as you said, to, to students who have been in school for over six years, which is usually working people who are going back to school or who can't afford to go to school full time. Um, so they're taking it away for, once again, the hardest working people who are trying desperately to live the quote unquote American dream that says if you go to college and get a degree, you'll get a better job and you'll have a better future. Sarah, why do you think these austerity measures are always targeted toward, toward the lowest economic I mean, down, it's like the people who need it the most. I mean, I know you're saying it's class war, but it just seems like it's just over and over again, these talks of eliminating the debt, and it's always just focused right on the people who need it the most. Those are the people who can't afford lobbyists. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty simple, right? The, who You kick people when they're down, they have a harder time fighting back. What do you think about this interest rate debate um, the freezing of the interest rates. Do you think that this is? Do you think that this is really um, going to change things if it's frozen or not frozen? Right? Do you think that there's a bigger issue at hand, and that this is kind of a distraction from that that bigger issue? Well, here's the thing. If they do actually let tuition, um, the interest rates double, that will materially affect a lot of students. Um, that's going to be thousands and thousands of students who will be paying twice as much interest on their student loans. It's absolutely an issue that we should be concerned about. The problem is right now that both parties in Congress agree we should extend the tuition, uh, freeze the tuition interest rates for a year. Um, that's one year, that's still not going to help. The economy is not magically going to be 100% better next year. Um, and meanwhile, they're just fighting over how to pay for it when, by the way, the government makes money on these loans, okay? Even at the, three, the lowest interest rate, even though around 3%, they're lending and they're making more money back than they are spending on these loans. So having these stupid arguments about how to pay for it, it's ridiculous. Sir, I see that you're wearing um, a red ribbon, and I know that's in solidarity with the, with the Canadian protests that are happening right now. How does their struggle um, relate to this struggle about the student debt crisis? Could you talk a little bit about that? So the red square is actually, um, it comes from the phrase, um, I'm sorry, my French is going to be off, so I'm just <laughs> not going to do it. But it's a reference to being squarely in the red or in debt. Um, so it's the same struggle there, right? The students in Quebec have been striking for, yesterday was their 100th day of striking, um, over a tuition hike, which is essentially is going to be more debt. Um, there are students in Australia protesting tuition hikes. There are students around this country protesting tuition hikes. Um, the students here at CUNY in New York have been protesting tuition hikes, and they've adopted the Red Square as part of their own movement. It's a symbol of the debt that we all have. I have student debt. I have had the same student debt for the last 10 years because I've essentially been able to only pay the interest on it for 10 years since I've been out of school. Um, it is a global movement, just like the aust austerity is the same. It's not exactly the same, but the policies are targeting the same people, and they are hitting in essentially the same ways around the world. And the students in Quebec and the students here in New York have been in communications. People that I know here have been up to Quebec to work with the students up there to learn their student union model and other tactics so that they can figure out how to get how we get 400, 500,000 people in the streets of New York, in the streets of Los Angeles, in the streets of San Francisco. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it seems like in other countries uh, there are massive protests of students fighting against this debt crisis in their countries, mm -hmm. and it just seems like why did it have to take the student debt to hit one trillion? And we're not really seeing that influx of, you know, thousands out in the streets 
protesting this? I mean, do you think that it's just kind of looming and that we're going to see that if nothing's done about this? I think the thing with debt is that it's delaying your it's delaying your payments, right? When you are taking out a college student loan, you don't think about having to pay it. You just think I'm going to get through school, I'm going to get a good job, and I'll pay it off. And that has sort of been true. Um, although, like I said, I graduated 10 years ago, and I'm still carrying the same ball and chain. Um, but now that the job market is terrible, that something like half of all recent college grads are either unemployed or underemployed, yeah. um, we're seeing the fallacy of that story, which is that you can go to school and you will get a good job, and it doesn't matter how much debt you took out. Right. I mean, for the first time. So I think it's time, creeping up on us here. Yeah, for the first time, more, more of those unemployed are college graduates than not. I mean, so, right. so what is the right. solution here other than, of course, alleviating the debt, expunging it, you know, offering uh, for you to be able to declare bankruptcy on it, all these things? I mean, should people start looking at alternatives other than going to college? I am a big fan of education. I have a <laughs> master's degree. I right. loved it. And I did. I went to school as an undergrad. I was an English major, which was certainly not going to get me a great job. Um, but I did it, and I loved it. And I don't want to be the person who's telling people not to go to school. However, I would say that if you are going to take out a massive amount of debt, you should think about where you're going to school, how much it's going to cost you, why you need to take out that much debt. Um, and also, we need to be organizing. This needs to be a movement. This is why I'm wearing this. This is why a lot of people around this city and around the, this country are now wearing this square. Because we need to understand that this is a political problem. It's not just a personal problem. It can't be solved by you taking out a little bit less or a little bit more debt each year. We need to freeze the tuition rates, uh, the interest rates. We need to lower interest rates. We need to write down the principal on these loans. We need to fund public universities so that kids can actually go to school for free or very little money. I mean, we really need to entirely rethink the way we pay for higher education in this country. It, it is a shame when people have to choose between going to college or, you know, thinking that it's not worth it anymore um, and it really is a sad state of affairs I, yeah it's going to be a really important crisis and struggle to follow thanks so much for your work sarah jaffe editor associate editor thanks. at alternate.org truth broadcast network may contain copyrighted material the use of which has not always been specifically authorized by the copyright owner we make this available in our efforts to advance understanding of criminal justice political human rights, economic, scientific, and social justice issues. This constitutes a fair use of any such copyrighted material as provided for in Section 107 of the U.S. Copyright Law. In accordance with Title 17 U.S.C. Section 107, the material on this site is distributed without profit to those who have expressed a prior interest in receiving the information. If you took $100 bills, stacked them on top of each other until you reached a trillion dollars, it would be over 678 miles high. This is what Americans owe in student loans. It's greater than America's credit card debt, or auto debt, and second only to the mortgage debt in the United States. Approximately two-thirds of all college students graduate with student loans. In 2010, the average one of those students had accumulated approximately $25,000 in debt by graduation day. That same year, the unemployment rate for college graduates under 25 was over 9%. One third of all graduates end up taking lower paying jobs that don't require college degrees. The number of underemployed college graduates has risen by 12 million in just 16 years. Over the past 25 years, the cost of college tuition has increased at an average rate that is higher than the general rate of inflation. Since 1986, the overall inflation rate has increased 115%, which is why things cost double what they used to. Education, however, has increased 498%. So say the cost of college tuition was $10,000 in 1986, today it would cost that same student over $59,000 more than two and a half times the general inflation rate. The biggest reason college tuition is rising is government intervention. As you may remember, 
This sounds very similar to what happened in the housing market. Through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government provided cheap and easy loans for everyone to buy a house. They promoted home ownership as the American dream, and with funding so easily available, home prices went up, and up, and up. Years later, we now know how the mortgage bubble ended, and now college education is headed down a very similar path. The government will provide almost anyone a loan to pay for college. This attracts more and more young people to go to college. Most of whom can't afford education without the government's help. On the surface, this may not seem like a bad thing, but with the government backing just about every loan, universities can raise tuition prices. First, because of high demand, and second, because they know students won't be denied financing from the government. But the more government aid goes up, the more tuition will rise. However, putting a limit on grants and loans would cap spiraling tuition prices. By taking away easily available funding, young adults would assess the true value of a college degree, and opt for alternatives to career and business training. It would reduce the demand for college, thus reducing the ability for colleges to raise tuition fees. The price of college would flatten or even come down. The buyers think that what they're buying will appreciate in value, making them rich in the future. The product grows more and more elaborate and more and more expensive, but the expense is offset by cheap credit provided by sellers who are eager to encourage buyers to buy. Buyers see that everyone else is taking on mounds of debt, and they're more comfortable when they do so themselves. Besides, for a generation, the value of what they buy has gone up steadily. What could go wrong? Everything continues smoothly until, at some point, it doesn't anymore. Yes, this sounds like the housing bubble, but I'm afraid it's also sounding a lot like the still inflating higher education bubble. College is getting more expensive, a lot more expensive. At an annual growth rate of 7.4 percent a year, tuition has vastly outstripped the consumer price index of 3.8 percent. It's skyrocketed past spiraling health care increases of 5.8 percent. Even the housing bubble, at its runaway peak, pales in comparison. Now consumers would balk, except that as with the housing bubble, cheap and readily available credit has let people borrow huge amounts of money to finance education, and both students and parents continue to believe that whatever the cost, a college education is a necessary ticket to future prosperity. But is it? Well, meet Courtney Mona, a 26-year-old graduate of New York University, recently reported by the New York Times to have nearly $100,000 in student loan debt, debt that her degree in religious and women's studies did not equip her with the actual job skills to repay. Payments on Courtney's debt are about $700 per month, equivalent to a respectable house payment and a major bite on her monthly income of $2,300 as a photographer's assistant earning an hourly wage. And unlike a bad mortgage on an underwater house, Courtney can't simply walk away from her student loans, which cannot be expunged in bankruptcy. She's stuck in a financial trap, and she's not alone. You know, even students who major in programs shown to increase earnings, like engineering, face limits on how much debt they can sanely amass. And with costs approaching sixty thousand dollars a year for many private schools and. Thirty thousand for state schools. Six-figure student loan debt is fast becoming the norm. Now, for many, the debt is enough to quash marriage plans. I mean, who wants to marry someone with huge amounts of unpayable debt? It's enough to prevent home ownership and generally wreak havoc on the debtors' lives. In fact, total student loan debt in America has passed the trillion-dollar mark, more than total credit card debt and more than total auto loan debt. But as prices have been going up. Learning seems to have been going down. A recent book, Academically Adrift, by Richard Aram and Josipa Roska, found that 45 percent of students did not demonstrate any significant improvement in learning during the first two years of college, and 36 percent of students did not demonstrate any significant improvement in learning over four years of college. 
The primary reason, according to the study, is that courses aren't very rigorous. In fact, a recent survey of more than 700 schools by the American Council of Trustees and Alumni found that many have virtually no requirements. Now, perhaps that's why students are studying 50% less than they were a couple of decades ago. And all of this is happening even as millions of people with college educations can't find jobs. Today, many graduates are already jumping the tracks to become skilled manual laborers, plumbers, electricians, and the like. The Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts that seven of the ten fastest growing jobs in the next decade will be based on on-the-job training rather than higher education. And there'll be hands-on jobs that are hard to outsource to foreigners. If you want your toilet fixed, it can't be done by somebody in Bangalore. People pursuing these careers will have greater job security in today's economy and will be free from the crushing debt amassed by their more educated peers. Bubbles form when too many people expect values to go up forever. Simply put, the cost of higher education has far outpaced its actual value. The bubble is going to burst. And to purchase this broadside, please visit us at www.encounterbooks.com. I don't know about you, but I'm not enjoying flushing my money down the toilet. Here's a question for you. How much sense does it make to be saddled with enough debt that you'll be able to buy a brand new car with that debt just so that you can go to college and get some officiating document that says you actually learned this shit when you could have learned that for free at the local library? Well, no, I mean, everybody has to pay into the system because if they didn't, then it wouldn't exist. And of course, that money couldn't come from anyone but you because you, the student, are rich, right? Well, I mean, at least your parents must be. I mean, you're lucky if you can find a job at this point, much less find one that requires you have a college education that has anything to do with what your major was. No, but of course, I mean, you can't always get what you want. Sure, but you know what? I don't think it's asking too much that the third of your life you're going to spend working is at least interesting, much less fulfilling. All you want is a system that actually facilitates that for as many people as possible, but pff, fuck that. Let's get some money. Of course, because that's what matters is whether or not you can make money doing what you do. It has nothing to do with whether or not you can be at all fulfilled for that third of your life. See, I have experience with this through the military paying me my education benefits through the post-9-11 GI Bill, which pays out double what the original GI Bill, the Montgomery GI Bill, paid out. And why is that? Well, as it's implied by the name, the post-9-11 GI Bill pays out so much more because you are so much more honorable for coming into the military after we started the war on terrorism. Right? Bullshit. Bull fucking shit has nothing to do with how honorable you are or whether or not you deserve it. Has everything to do with the fact that education prices have been fucking skyrocketing. They had to change things and start paying out more because if they didn't, the Montgomery GI Bill is pennies by comparison to what you need as a student to actually eke out an existence in this society. At this point, people are working harder and getting paid less, just so that they can secure some income and some job-related security. So a student gives up however many years of work, and maybe is making part-time wages during that time, gets out of college with enough debt that they could buy a brand new car, gets married, adds their debt onto another student's debt, so now you've got two brand new cars worth of debt, and then you're starting out life with that much debt, yeah, every employer out there is going to love to employ you because you're not going to cause any fucking trouble. At this point, college guarantees nothing. You know what? Sure. Maybe it never did, but at least it used to give you a fighting chance of getting a good fucking wage. So, of course, you're not as likely to be able to get a job that's going to have anything to do with the major that you had in college, so you're not as likely to be able to make as much money, so we'd better suck you dry of all your fucking money while you have it now. 
We're going to milk you dry so much that you're going to have to pay for a new code to be able to get the quizzes out of your used textbooks. How do people not see that this is a scam? Congratulations, America. Your tax dollars pay my military education benefits just so that I can get something called a degree, which is just a piece of paper that says I learned this stuff when I could have learned it anyway on my own at the public fucking library. The money's just being fucking wasted. Not to mention all that shit going on with the Fed recently with the... 16 trillion dollars with the audit, but who gives a fuck about that, right? It's a scam, and Americans need to realize that it just doesn't mean as much financially as it used to to go through college. The only reason I'm going to college is because I'm afforded the opportunity to go for free thanks to my military benefits. And even then, I'm only going for my personal betterment at this point because I don't expect to be able to make a career out of anything that I learn there. But hey, Maybe I'll get lucky. But you know what? You shouldn't have to get lucky for the system to serve its goddamn purpose. Isn't that sad? That it's a bad gamble as to whether or not you'll even be able to make your college education mean shit. Long days and pleasant nights. Truth Broadcast Network is not responsible for the content of independent broadcasters. We are a loose affiliation of activists bonded together by our common struggle. As such, the network is here to act as a central hub for truth activism. The network is here to aid both those creating content, and those searching for it. All broadcasters act independently and they connect through the network. Broadcasters have no control over the network and the network has no control over them. There is no liability on the part of any broadcaster for any action or statement that is not their own. Hello everybody, this is a bit of an update from my video that I made about 10 months ago that was entitled, How I Completed Two Years of College in Two Months. Um, for those of you who don't know, I took 12 AP tests my senior year, I passed 10 of them, I entered college with 40-some credits, and basically I had two years out of college out of the way before I went. I just completed my first year of college a couple weeks ago, and I have one year to go. I'm graduating either in spring of 2012 or fall of 2012, depending on where I'm studying abroad and what courses I'll be able to take there that are equivalent to my major here. Um, but nonetheless, I'll be graduating in 2012, which corresponds with what I said in the previous video. So, everything I claim there is still true, still on track with that. However, this video is not so much about how to um, encourage you or tell you how to complete college in two years or three years, although I do definitely recommend it because you will save a shitload of money. Um... This video is mainly just how I feel about college in general, and right now I feel that college is a gigantic scam. A scam to get your money. Now ever since you were a little kid, when you were five, six, seven, whenever, when you start elementary school, your parents, they'd always tell you, now pay attention to school and get good grades so you can get into a good college and get a good job. And your teachers would tell you that too. Ever since elementary school, middle school, and high school, definitely, they're all saying, oh, get good grades, take lots of extracurriculars, volunteer, so you can have all these good things on your application so you can get into a really good college. Because if you get into a good college, that's the ticket to getting a really good job. Then you'll make lots of money and have a great future and be really, really successful and you'll be happy. That's what they tell you. Co getting into a good college equals happiness. A college degree equals happiness. It equals a lot of money. Basically, it's ingrained into our minds for kindergarten through 12th grade that you need to get into a good college. Going to college is the answer. And so what does that create? It is created a nation full of kids who are going to college. However, they're not all going to good colleges. They're not all becoming educated at college. They are going to whatever college they can get into, and then they're majoring in whatever. And that basically ends up with the students having a piece of paper after four years of paying the school $100,000 or more that... 
they get a piece of paper that says they're smarter for some reason, and then because of that piece of paper that says they are smarter for some reason, employers will look at them a little more favorably. But of course, in this current job market, that is not even true. Having a piece of paper isn't going to make you more competitive. It's basically a requirement. If you don't have a college degree, most employers will weed you out, and it'll be much, much harder to even get an interview, much less a job. This was not the case 50 years ago, back in your parents' or grandparents' day, back when getting a high school degree was the benchmark. Back then, you could get a nice desk job with a high school degree. Degree. With lots of work experience, you could work your way up. College college was for more rich people. It was for people who were more privileged. Were there some more ordinary people who went to college? Of course. They're one of um, my great... Um, how am I related to them exactly? Um, one of my great uncles, yes, one of my great uncles had six kids. And they all... And they grew up pretty poor, but... All of the six kids worked really hard in school, and they all got full rides into colleges. Now, that's pretty impressive. And so I'm not saying that never happened. I'm not saying people who weren't as privileged didn't go to college. But I'm saying it was mainly privileged people whose parents were so rich that it didn't matter if they went to college and did nothing because they could be taken care of their whole life with their wealth. Or it would be taken by students who were actually very bright and could actually do something very productive with their college degree. Or it was a combination of the two, very bright people who also had affluent parents. Now, however, it seems like every single student, whether they're poor, rich, smart, stupid, motivated, unmotivated, um, want to have a career path as a doctor or as a whatever, are deciding to go to college. And this is I feel this is bad for several reasons. One, it creates a giant, basically it creates the artificial need for college when college is not actually needed. So essentially, a bunch of, there's masses of students now who are in college because they need to go to college just to get some job that doesn't actually require anything that they learn in college. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, college will show employers that you're able to finish something that you started. Like, that's BS. Basically, the only thing that determines if you finish college is if you run out of money or not. Like, college isn't hard. The reason why so many students drop out is because they cannot afford it. It has nothing to do with intelligence. And that's another reason why I think college is a scam. Because college classes, they aren't difficult, they aren't challenging, and above all, they don't teach you anything. It's full of all of this busy work where you complete a few assignments, you write a couple papers, you take a couple tests uh, that have stuff on it that you memorize from all of these vocabulary words and basic terms and like bolded things in the textbook, and... So the te basically, you just do those. The teacher has something to grade. They don't actually teach you anything. They don't help you think critically. You just sort of fill them out, turn them in, get your A or your B, and then you move on. Like, honestly, if you do the work in the classes, there's no way you're not going to get A's or B's. Unless you're really, really, really dim. But even if you're really, really, really dim, you're still able to pass your classes if you're paying that money to those colleges. Because the colleges, they want the students to pass. You know why? Because if more students pass, more students will go to their colleges because there's a high passing rate and then they'll make more money off of their students. And the reason why they're able to charge so much money is because of all these student loans that the, st that the government is giving out. Like, it's ridiculous how so many of these students who come from these families that make barely any money, the government will give them like 100000 plus in student loans, and then they're expected to pay these student loans off throughout their whole life. And if you go to some private college and get your degree in sociology or women's studies, which is what a lot of these students from less than affluent families are doing, then they're probably not going to get a job that pays very much. Social work does not pay very much. Um, and even worse, if you get a degree in sociology or geography or whatever. Like, I'm not saying that those are stupid majors, although they kind of are, but unless you want to be a professor in that major, there's a very specific, specific career that that major requires, then your chances are the job that you'll end up with, you wouldn't have needed that major. Like, there are so many careers out there with different companies where people in those companies have a varying amount of degrees, where one colleague got an English degree, another got a sociology degree, another got a psychology degree, another got a political science degree, another got a business degree. Uh, one has his PhD, but they're all in the same job. Like, that's just proof that what degree you get does not matter. All that matters is that you spent all this money on a degree 
so you could get a job. So basically, you're required to spend thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in order just to get a job. No wonder there's this gigantic income gap. No wonder the wealthier people get wealthy and the poorer people get poorer. The poorer people either can't afford to go to college altogether, or they take out these gigantic loans which will keep them poor their entire life, and they'll use most of the time major in something that won't pay that well, and then they won't be able to pay off these loans until they're way later in their life, and they're going to be way behind financially, whereas the people who are wealthy, they won't need to take out loans. Their parents will pay for all their tuition, and plus, more than likely, their rich parents have connections which will get them a great job anyway, regardless of what they major in. So really, the only people who will actually benefit truly from college are middle-class people with fairly affluent parents who do their research beforehand and major in something that's actually a good investment that actually requires a college degree and will actually make them a significant amount of money that they will be able to pay off their tuition, most likely, if they do well and are a good candidate for the job. Some of these degrees include being a doctor, being a lawyer, being a nurse, being a college professor, being a some sort of science, scientist, some sort of researcher, some sort of engineer. Those are specified careers that actually require a college degree and are a good investment if you are serious about it, a good student, get good internships, basically if you prepare yourself as a good candidate. However, most people don't do their research, they go to college, they get shitty grades, they go and drink and party and smoke all the time, and then $100,000 later with their 2.9 GPA and their sociology degree from their college that cost them 50000 a year, they're wondering, why can't I get a job? Well, you idiot. One, the economy's terrible. Yes, we're in a recovery, but a lot of the jobs that are being added are by, like, McDonald's and Walmart, so they really aren't helping because those jobs take away, like, three or four jobs for every job those huge corporations add. And second of all, if you don't actually get a degree that's valuable, you're not going to be seen as a, a valuable candidate compared to all these other candidates that actually did their research. <sighs> So basically, I just think it's unfortunate that college is such a scam that people don't realize it. I think it's unfortunate that the government is giving out all these gigantic student loans because that's letting these universities get away with charging these ridiculous amounts of money for tuition. I think it's unfortunate that students feel they need to go to college and that they basically have to go to college just to get a decent job when really you aren't learning anything in college that will help you with that job. It's basically just paying for a job. Those are my opinions on college. I think it's a scam. I think people need to stop going unless they're going into a specified field and try to basically make a good career for themselves. I think this country needs way more entrepreneurs. I think we're way too reliant on all these huge multinational corporations who treat their employees like shit and pay them minimum wage. I think we need way more entrepreneurs, way more small businesses. And honestly, if you're a smart, motivated person, and you probably am if you're one of my subscribers and watch my videos, if you're a smart, motivated person, you should be your own entrepreneur. Be an entrepreneur, start your own business, follow your passion. What is it you like to do? Do you like to paint? Do you like to sculpt? Do you like to build furniture? Do you like to raise animals? Whatever you want to do, you should go for it, and you should try to create your own business and create your own wealth. Or how to transform my knowledge and the information that I have gathered into actual usable, practical application that can be used to contribute to society. So not only do we have loads of people who get these educations and these huge student loans, often their educations will be in many respects completely useless because they're only, they're like fictional, they're ab at an abstract level. Today I was reading a blog by Bernard Pullman in Creation's Journey to Life blog series and it's called Day 122 True Activist College Edition. So basically this blog post is about the fraud that is currently occurring in the college and university education system and how we as students are participating in this system without completely realizing and admitting to ourselves how we're actually partaking in a system of fraud that is abusing us as students while pretending to be providing us with an education. 
one of the points that Bernard mentions in this blog is how, for example, that's like a very obvious um, example of the fraud that occurs, where textbooks will be republished um, year after year, where only minor amendments have been made. For example, uh, a new preface has been added, and then students are asked um, to buy these new editions in order to be able to participate in courses. And if you are a student, you'll probably recognize that textbooks are extremely expensive compared to other types of books, which is quite ironic considering how students are some of the people who have the least amount of money often in the system. And so in relation to this point, I was last year I took a course in educational sociology and labor market sociology. And it was we were discussing about educa higher education and uh, data was, was uh, laid out that showed how more people are taking university educations than ever before, um, more people are getting PhDs and master degrees, and there is a clear over-education problem in, now this is in a scan Now in education, the U.S. Department of Education has announced that 79% of Chicago 8th graders are not proficient in reading, and they've also announced that 80% of Chicago 8th graders are not proficient in math. This comes on the heels of teachers striking in Chicago, demanding more rights, better pay, more benefits. They currently receive about three months worth of vacation and their average salary is about $76,000. Yet despite these dismal numbers, they feel that they need more. This isn't only about the teachers in Chicago. This is about government-run schools and how ineffective they are. In my estimation, we should just privatize schools, just like uh, people go shopping for groceries. They can go shopping for schools. It's well known that private schools outperform public schools significantly with less money. So despite the horrible track record that um, the teachers union has here, they want to raise. And again, it's not about bashing teachers. It's about accountability, the, ab the ability to fire people the ability to uh, keep them and pay them even more if, if they're worth it. So that's what that's about. And we actually have some books here that give you the lowdown on the state of our education system, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, written by Charlotte Thompson, I hope I pronounced this right, Iserby, gives you an honest look on the current state of our education system. And while we were back in the warehouse, we also found some other fun books for the kids. And I know some people watching this are going to blog and say, how, how can the InfoWars team plug products? Well, look, we're capitalists here. That's what we are. We believe in the free market. I know that might scare some people, but um, that's what we're all about. Some of the, the books we have here are the U.S. Constitution books for kids. Talks about that sacred document called the Constitution that Republicrats urinate on. And we've got some other books here, Woodrow for President and Liberty Lee's Tale of Independence. You can get these on InfoWarsShop.com. As a kid, I had to walk two miles to school in two feet of snow, and, and when I was a kid, anyone could afford to go to college. Actually, both those things are true. Uh, unfortunately, the same thing can't be said today, as young people who want a college education today are screwed. You've got to have a pile of this stuff in order to go to college. College tuition prices are skyrocketing, making it very hard to go to college and leaving those who don't have stacks of hundreds lying around to graduate from college tens of thousands of dollars in debt. In fact, out students, outstanding student loan debt hit a trillion dollars last year. 
and now exceeds credit card debt and auto loan debt in America for the first time in world history. And to make matters worse, Congress is about to increase student loan interest rates just so they can pay for our wars in the Middle East and avoid making millionaires and billionaires pay their fair share in taxes. In response to this, college students delivered more than 130,000 petitions to Congress today asking our elected officials to stop the proposed rate increase. But is that enough? How do mountains of debt affect new graduates? And is the government investing nearly enough in our intellectual infrastructure? Joining me now is Dan Seufer, Vice President of the Lexington Institute, and Molly Catchpole, a recent college graduate stuck with a six-figure student loan debt. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for having us. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Molly, first of all, tell us what happened on Capitol Hill today and uh, what, you, what you students and former students are asking lawmakers to do. Sure. Well, I work for a, a nonprofit organization that lobbies on behalf of working Americans and middle class Americans. And we partnered with a U.S. PERG, Campus Progress, and the U.S. Student Association to uh, deliver all these petitions. Rebuild the Dream took care of most of the online petitions, and the other groups uh, took care of the on the ground work at college campuses. And we were basically telling Congress that um, they that we can't afford the for the uh, rate to double. It can't. We just flat out cannot afford Don, it. Don, um, the GI Bill was largely responsible for almost tripling the number of college graduates as a percentage of our population in the United States. This was a massive government support program. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and from that point until Ronald Reagan uh, became president, college tuition in California was free. In many states, it was really, really cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at this number, a trillion dollars in student loan debt, more than credit card debt. Don't you consider that a crime? The cost of higher education has skyrocketed to the point that it's long since out of control. And we, from a public policy point of view, need to make sure that we're not doing anything that puts any upward pressure on the price of college and doing everything we can do from a policy point of view to bring down the cost of college. Are you suggesting that if, if we were to do GI Bill again because people would have money to spend on college, that the price of college was, would go up? Is that the little verbal jujitsu that's coming? Well, if the only thing that you're doing is throwing more tax dollars into the system and, and nothing else to put transparency on, for instance, higher ed institutions that jack up the tuition, then you could argue in economic terms that why you are not, Why not just say pressure. that uh, you know, we're not going to give any more federal aid to for-profit colleges? Well, for-profit for you know, colleges have been singled out, sure. They have but, the highest but, failure rate. They have the highest indebtedness. Well, more recently, though, the, the greater increases in tuition are happening at four-year public institutions. The problem's all over, and there's not one solution that's going to fix it. We need to look at the situ situation overall. Well, we used to subsidize colleges massively. I mean, Molly, how does student loan debt affecting you? I mean, I'm paying about $650 a month in loans. I'm one of the first people in my family to go to college, and it was, it was really important for my family that I went. Um, and, and I can barely... I can barely afford that. I mean, I'm on a 10-year plan, um, and I'm just I'm trying to pay more to get my principal uh, loan down. Uh, but it's really, really difficult. I'm lucky I have a job. Yeah. Really lucky. I, I didn't graduate from college, but when I did go to college, I was able to do that. I was able to put myself through school to the extent that I did mm -hmm. by picking apples in the summer, mm -hmm. by being a DJ part-time for $3.25 an hour and working in a gas station. My wife worked as a waitress in a Howard Johnson's and put herself through school. I mean, you could do that back in the 60s and the early 70s, and then Reagan came along and all this stuff blew up. I mean, you, know, you had Bill Bennett, Secretary of Education, who wanted to end the Department of Education. This was, I'm, I'm assuming that you know people from the next generation up who went through that. I mean, and, and, and what's happening to kids, your, to young people your age? Not, you're not a kid. But. I mean, so, just, you know, just the fact that people still think that you can put yourself entirely through college by working the whole time is just like it's crazy and it just shows how out of touch people are I think um, it, there's I, I know very very few people who could do that um, and it's just it, I mean it's also just crazy to me that we have to do that to begin with yeah. you know that that's the belief that you should just work to put yourself through school Don, Don of the 34 OECD nations the organization of economic the 34 richest nations in the, in the world we are the only one that does this to our students. In fact, most of, those, most of those nations give students free college. In Denmark, they pay you a $200 a month stipend to go to college, all the way up to PhD. Same in, I believe it's the same in Finland, Norway, Sweden. Uh, in Germany, you can get free college after you do a year of public service. I mean, what's wrong with America? Why, you know, and, and why do conservatives like you want to hang on to this broken, dysfunctional system that, that dumps people like Molly basically out on the street with $100,000 in debt when she should be walking out with a, with a degree in her hand and looking for a job. 
the higher ed system at f almost 4% of GDP is a drain on the rest of the economy. One of the major problems... How is that possible? Well, I think there's a lot if of reasons. If it's 4% of GDP, one. it's a business. But, but if, if, it's, if it's, you know, my head is exploding. I mean, every other country in the world, every other developed country in the world says we're going to invest in our intellectual infrastructure. What's wrong with doing that? Well, I think one problem is that when you have high school graduates who lack the basic skills to succeed in college, you're basically That's passing an unfunded about. mandate to the That's not what system. we're talking about. That's the result of 30 years of attacking our public school system. What I'm talking about is the attack on our college system. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's, why, not, why not go back to the University of California the way it was before Reagan took a meat axe to it? Well, where's you can go to college for free. Where's the transparency and the accountability for that the... That made a for fortune the, for the state of California. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the whole Silicon Valley thing happened because ca California had free college. It drew the best and the brightest. Mm -hmm. Don't we want to be a nation of the best and the brightest? Where is the accountability for the officials who jack up the price of tuition as their first recourse rather than have some transparency on where that money's going? Well, that's, that's uh, Molly, do you think that this uh, bubble is about to burst, the student debt bubble? Are you seeing people who are just about to walk away from or freak out or bankruptcy? I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, the last couple of months of school, I started freaking out about it. I mean, like, I had to find a job. I had to find a good-paying job. Um, you know, we can't, we can't, you can't put them off any further. You have, you'll, or else you get a forbearance fee, you know? I mean, like, it's just crazy. Um, and, you know, we tell students starting at age 10 that they have to go to college. Yeah. You know, and then we stop. And then we stop public education at twelfth grade. It, right. right. Yeah. Don, Molly, thank you very much for being thank with you. us. Thank you. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks. If all you do is post on Facebook, you are hiding your information from the real world and the real internet. Nothing will ever come up in a search engine. If you want to avoid being censored, blocked, or shut down, then post on Truth Broadcast Network. You can then share the professional web pages inside the free speech zone. This way your material will come up in search engines, and it will exist inside and outside the free speech zone. Facebook is a trap. Empower yourself, by empowering Truth Broadcast Network. Remember to contact us with your username so we can allow your profile privileges to post.